Wow, I think we're almost done with this volume. Wow. Okay. I'm not complaining. I think this is part nine at this point. The Harspiel concert. Now, how many more pages do we have left? Uh, 58 pages. And that's not even counting if there's any shorts in there. Or short stories, whatever. Little extras. The Hurstville concert. I returned to the castle the day before the concert. I needed to iron out the final details with Elvira and the others. Plus, Ella needed to go to the castle's kitchen so that she could mass-produce cookies as an experienced sweet chef. While Fran and Gail were carrying my things, Monica and I headed to Ferdinand's room to inform him of our departure. As soon as we stepped inside, he met me with a thoroughly displeased expression. I am not accompanying you, and I will not help to prepare the concert. Did I not say that already? You did, and that is quite all right. All I need you to do is play the Harshville tomorrow. Given that Wilma was currently in the process of stacking illustrations of him into a carriage, I was honestly grateful that Ferdinand wasn't coming with us. Oh, he would, if he can't just wind of what you're doing, he is going to tear, he's going to destroy those pamphlets, those programs. He's going to destroy them. I said my farewells, then left the room with a smile. Leading up to today, I had printed as many illustrations of Ferdinand as I could. There were three different versions, and we had a hundred of each. Keeping them limited in quality was the best way to encourage people to buy them. Okay, that wasn't entirely true. I had wanted to make as many as possible since I knew they would sell like hotcakes, but I simply didn't have the time. If I had been able to, I would have printed a greater variety of illustrations too. <laughs> Oh, I bet you would have. Oh, they would spread around the noble quarter like wildfire. And Ferdinand would be able to do nothing to stop him because if he tried to destroy them, people would find out. <laughs> and they would get mad and want more. We made our way to the castle. Ella and Rosina were in the carriage for attendance while my two guard knights and I got into the carriage for nobles. Come now, Rosemine, we are simply out of time. Elvira and Florencia were already waiting for me in the castle. They brought me to the concert hall before I could even go to my room, and we started checking over everything there. <coughs> the seats for tomorrow were already prepared. I walked over to the stage where Ferdinand would be playing, checked to make sure that there was enough space around, and then took a look at the standing gallery. Despite the name Standing Gallery, the reality is that we're dealing with a group of elegant noble women and daughters here. For this reason, the standing gallery was made up of a number of seats placed in close proximity to one another, separated only at certain points to allow those of different factions to sit apart. Once I had finished looking in for the concert hall, I checked the sound of applying magic tools, ensured that the suites were being prepared, and then discussed the matter of security. There were several doors for entering and exiting the hall, one for Ferdinand, one for the waiters, one for attendees. I also checked the empty rooms that would serve as medical rooms if necessary. Here's hoping you won't need them. I see that everything has been prepared exactly as discussed, I said. Once I had double-checked everything to do with the concert, I ended up being given the role of concert host. There were three reasons for this. Nobody had ever hosted a concert before, so we were all equally fit for this position. I was young enough that the ladies wouldn't envy me for beginning to stand on stage with Ferdinand. Oh, definitely, dear God, for that. And I was the one who was getting gathering donations in the first place. Incidentally, Rosemine, how did the illustration come out? Elvira asked, leaning forward in anticipation after we had finished ironing out the details. Perfectly, I responded while puffing out my chest. She would love them for sure. Allow me to look, Elvira instantly replied. I would love to see as well, Florencia said. Since they both wanted to see the illustrations, we moved things to my room, where the boxes of pictures had already been carried. Elvira was able to enter the northern building with Florencia's permission, so there was no problem with us talking there. Riarda sent off an ordinance telling my attendants to prepare for our arrival, since he had already been prepared by the time we reached my room. I lined up three letter-sized boxes on the table that Lutz had prepared for the illustrations to be carried in. They were reasonably thin, which made them pretty easy to carry, and were apparently used and the Gilberta Company for storing documents. I opened each one with a delicate yet deliberate movement to add to the excitement. My, my, my! Elvira exclaimed, her eyes glimmering as she examined the illustrations. Florencia seemed shocked at how many copies of the same illustration we had and started flipping through them to make sure that they really were all the same. I had heard about your printing before, but now that I see the results, I find myself at a complete loss for words. Is this what printing can do? Yes, Florencia, I would like to build orphanages and workshops in other cities to spread printing further, and it is to that end that I am seeking donations. One look at these illustrations is all I need to understand the value in what you are doing. It truly is wonderful. I think everybody else would agree when they see those pictures of Ferdinand. Oh, God. They are going to go flying off of the wherever you're having them sold at. 
With that done, I started training both of my attend both my attendants and Florencia's attendants how to sell things during the concert. First would be the programs, and then once the concert was over, we would bring in the suites and illustrations on carts and sell them. Oh, but would things not be more orderly if we sold the illustrations before the concert? No, I think it will be best to wait for Ferdinand to finish playing and leave. It is safe to assume that he will confiscate them all the moment he sees them, and that is what we need to avoid above all else. That certainly would be problematic. I say we do as Rosemind says, and ensure that Lord Ferdinand does not catch sight of them. Elvira said with a serious look on her face before starting to iron out where the attendants would wait and where the carts would be pushed to. I took this opportunity to ask Florencia about something exceedingly important. Um, Florencia... Does my dear adoptive father Sylvester know about this concert? He has heard that we will be building a large-scale tea party, but that is all. It would be best if he does not learn the details, as I am sure that he wouldn't be able to resist coming and making a mess of things for his own amusement. That is precisely why I have had magic tools repaired to keep sounds from leaking out of the room. Take care not to mention a word of this at dinner tonight, Rosemine. Florencia offered me a graceful smile, her hands firmly gripping Sylvester's reins. I was in full agreement. It was a safe bet that Sylvester would come to crash the party as soon as he found out, so keeping quiet was the best option for all of us. With that fear settled, I got to work writing a script that I would read as the host. I naturally included a bit about the virtues of printing, and I can imagine that a passage about Ferdinand taking part out of the goodness of his heart would likely be necessary as well. I didn't have the time to do much else, though. And so came the day of the concert. I looked around the room while waiting for the attendants to arrive. attendees to arrive. The sound-related magic tools were functioning without issue. The waiters had tea and sweets at the ready, Ferdinand had arrived and was waiting in a back room, and there were twenty members of the Knights Order, including Eckerd, stationed throughout the room at regular intervals. Most of them had apparently heard Ferdinand play the harsh people before and were just using guard duty as an excuse to listen to him again. Oh, so they don't have to pay! <laughs> My, my, will we be able to hear the harsh feel in such a sizable room, one attendee asked. Look at the stage. They seem to have prepared a number of magic tools to that very end. I wonder why there are knights posted around us. They aren't just standing attendees, are they? No, they're just to make sure that nothing gets out of hand. Chatter filled the room as I nervously climbed the stage. I inhaled deeply, then held the voice amplifying magic tool that Florencia had given me up to my mouth like a microphone. I thank you all for attending this harsh feel concert starting Lord, starring Lord Ferdinand himself. This is a charity concert to raise donations to provide food, work, and housing to orphans in Haas. The sales from the tickets you have purchased will all go toward the construction of an orphanage. And if you look to your side, you will see that we are selling programs for today's events. The money from these sales will be added to our donations. So we'll be very grateful to all those who perform the generous and moral act of purchasing one. I held up a stencil illustration and Elvira and Florencia stood up to be the first customers. They were essentially leading the way for everybody else, who, which seemed to have worked as the women be belonging to Florencia's faction also got up. My, have a look. They're all the same illustration. This artist is exceedingly talented. What a beautiful illustration this is. I can see Elvira sitting closer to the stage than anyone else, showing off her program to the noble women sitting beside her. We're charging three large silvers per copy. Technology that produces identical copies of text and illustrations is known as printing. I intend to give orphans work in the printing industry, which will help be to both their benefit and ours. <coughs> Sorry. All I humbly ask is for your monetary support. With Riarda and Adelie handling sales, the noble women as steadily bought more and more programs. Goodness, she certainly is kind to go so far for the sake of orphans. If only she would direct that kindness to those who deserve it more. Who would deserve it more? The orphans deserve it the most. They've got nothing. Greedy much? I thought this was exceedingly expensive for a single piece of paper, but this illustration truly is amazing. I cannot say that I've ever seen this style of art before. This is the first time I've ever seen an illustration copied so perfectly and so many times before. The standing gallery was mostly filled with lay nobles as expected, so very few of them moved to buy the programs. But they did seem interested in them. When one person bought one, the others all swarmed around her. We, also have, we have also prepared tea and sweets that Lord Ferdinand is known to have, ta have a taste for. We have more in the kitchen, so if you like them, I would be very grateful if you bought some once the concert is over. With waiters serving tea and sweets to the tables, it did feel very much like a tea party. A sight of so many high-class ladies discussing the songs they were fam weren't familiar with were pu while pouring over the artistry of the illustrations made it unlike any concert that I was familiar with, but as they only ever listened to music during tea parties... A whole concert centered around music was a new experience for them. Now then, Lord Ferdinand shall begin, I said, before leaving the stage and speed walking to Ferdinand's waiting room. 
Ferdinand, are you ready to play, I asked, and Ferdinand, wearing the long sleeved robes of a noble, stood up with his horse feel. The moment we stepped into the concert hall, I noticed Ferdinand freeze in place. He resumed walking a split second later, but I heard him quietly murmur, Why are there so many? Everybody here has donated money to me, I said. That wasn't a lie, since just buying a ticket counted as donating money. Well, still, there are too many. This is simply a ridiculous number of people. I merely waited in the temple while Mother and Florencia prepared the concert, so I assumed this was a tur normal turnout for a noble event. Is that not the case, I asked, playing dumb as I guided Ferdinand to his seat in the middle of the stage? Once again, once there, I get, again colorfully expressed my gratitude to him, to the audience, talking about how he pitied the suffering orphans and was helping spread printing for their sake. Ferdinand's face twisted into a momentary grimace, but he was a skilled noble, unlike me, and was thus able to quickly read the room. Wearing a plastered-on smile, he looked over the audience. I shall now play the harshfiel as an expression of my gratitude to all of you who have donated in support of our efforts. Ferdinand said before sitting down in his seat and readying his harshfiel. The anger in his eyes screamed, I will remember th I will I will remember this. <laughs> oh, Rosemine is gonna get it later. Especially with the other illustrations if he finds out. Oh, it's good. that gonna go good. <laughs> but I didn't let that bother me. Light streamed in through the windows, beaming down onto Ferdinand from his right and making his heart feel gleam. He lowered his head a little, causing his light blue hair to fall and cast a shadow on his face. And as his fingers touched the string, a few notes poured out. A deep wong came from his left hand, a sharp ting from his right. It seemed that he was checking the sounds. Ferdinand raised his head and looked at me. He was ready. I looked around the audience and saw that the arch noble ladies and daughters who had paid top dollar to sit in the front row were already giving Ferdinand heated <laughs> <laughs> Poor Ferdinand, I feel bad for him getting all those freaking ladies up on his back. Good God. Ferdinand has prepared new songs to play for you all. This first one is dedicated to Leidenschaft, the god of fire. Ferdinand looked down at his heart spill, then began to smoothly strum it. He supported the neck of the instrument with his left hand while playing with his middle finger. His left hand made slow, low sounds reverberate through the air while his right produced sharper, clearer sounds. A moment later, Ferdinand's usually expressionless face softened. The furrows that were always present between his brows disappeared, and the sharp edges in his golden knife smoothed over. It was hard to tell from a distance, but his lips were also curved into ever, ever so slightly into a natural smile. That's, uh, very rare to see. I guess it's only when he's playing the harsh bill that he can relax a little bit like that. That alone was enough to drastically change how the audience saw him, and the customers in the front row were all trembling with their hands over their mouth. I'm glad to see Elvira's having a good time. <laughs> Ferdinand's long fingers with visible knuckles practically caressing the harsh feel as he strummed its strings. He played note after note, masterfully melding them together to form music so gentle it almost seemed to melt into the air. It was as beautiful as ever. The man himself was always being mean at give, or giving dark, evil smiles, but when the songs he played were so sweet and tender, it was like he was someone else entirely. I had assumed that there would be a big fuss with Elvira's throbbing heart taking over as soon as Ferdinand started playing, but perhaps due to their good upbringings, everybody just was just quietly listening to the music, looking flushed and spellbound. When Ferdinand started to sing in his low, beautiful, reverberating voice, I felt a shiver run down my spine. The sound amplifying magic tools were no doubt playing a part in this, but it felt as though I was wearing headphones and he was whispering right in my ears. <sighs> Oh, here we go. Oh, no. <laughs> Dear Lord. And then came the heavy, sensual sighs. So Vara was normally full of bubbly excitement when it came to Ferdinand. But all things considered, she knew him pretty well. She was listening with glittering eyes and a hand on her cheek, but the youngest, the younger daughters, who had never had a chance to see Ferdinand before, were blushing bright red with tear-filled eyes, their hands either pressed against their hearts or covering their faces. Some were resting their hands against the table to try and hide their expressions, while others struggled to remain calm as to not attract any unnecessary attention. But one thing was for sure. A storm was raging in all of their hearts. Ah. If I strain my ears just a little, I can hear their inner voices wailing and writhing. The noble daughters were having a huge moment. But since they weren't causing any problems, the knights stayed at their posts and kept their eyes on Ferdinand. For a moment, I thought that we wouldn't be needing their help after all. But that was when it happened. Uh-oh. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Don't tell me! He started playing the love song where the god of life doted on the goddess of earth and a woman fainted. Oh no. Of course that would happen. At least one time it had to happen. 
Things were bad enough already, given that we were using a magic tool to amplify his voice, so that those sitting near the back could hear. What would happen when they heard Ferdinand sweetly pleading for their love in his beautiful voice? It was a song that managed to take over, take even my breath away. And I already knew what the lyrics were. From what I could see, it was enough to make the noble daughters' hearts throb pounding so hard that they couldn't even control themselves. This is a popular anime song aimed at kids, you know. No, they don't know that. It was a lengthy song that had proven powerful enough to make Wilma's fear of men temporarily melt away. And naturally, it was having a huge effect on these noble women. Wenla had a sweet, heavy sigh before collapsing onto the table in front of her. Angelica, please direct the knights to take that woman to the infirmary. I instructed in a quiet voice, and Angelica vanished from behind me without making a sound. It was only a matter of moments before several other women started to collapse, and the knights had to start hurriedly carrying them out of the hall. Meanwhile, em Elvara was trembling in place. She was no doubt fighting as hard as she could to stop herself from passing out, given that she had previously said she would never be so foolish as to fall unconscious and missed the rare opportunity to hear Ferdinand playing the harsh field. Good luck, mother. Angelica slipped back into place behind me while the knight's order continued working wonders and informed me that Eckert wanted to see me. I exited the concert hall midway through Ferdinand's performance where I found that Eckert wasn't the only one waiting for me. Uh-oh. Oh, no! Fuck. Please don't tell me that's Sylvester talking. Oh, no. Oh, no! Looks like you've been having a lot of fun without me, huh? Rose mine? Oh no, it is him! Sylvester? He was standing in the hallway, beaming a crude grin, while Karstad was standing behind, beside him, cradling his head. According to Eckerd, Sylvester had passed by the concert hall just as some of the noble ladies were being carried out. Uh-oh. Sylvester's dark green eyes gleamed. I don't think you informed me of this, Rose mine. Goodness, I thought for sure the Florencia would have said something. Don't think you can fool me. I glanced at the door to the concert hall with a cold sweat running down my back. It was all going so well. I had to avoid it messing it up no matter the cost. I did not believe you had the interest in gathering donations, Sylvester. But if you wish to assist this off errand fest, I would find nothing more encouraging, I said. Sylvester simply raised a dubious eyebrow in response, so I racked my brain as hard as I could to find a peaceful solution to all this. I would like to entrust you with the valuable position of concluding the concert with one final song. If you go and retrieve your Hirschfield now, then I am sure you can still make it in time. The true protagonist of a story is always late after all. You know, I like the way you put that. Karstad, fetch my Hirschfield, he ordered. Karstad shot me an extremely worried look. Are you sure about this, Rosemine? It's better than him ruining everything, I replied. Once Karstad had gone to get the Hirschfield, I asked Sylvester for a song he could play without needing to discuss things with Ferdinand first, then noted it down on my diptych. Karstad came back with the Hirschfield in no time at all. Lady Rosemine, the concert has con concluded, Bridget said quietly after exiting the concert hall. I hurriedly went back inside and climbed onto the stage. I shall now introduce a special visitor. Ah, Mary Best, please come in. A door was opened by the knight stationed by it, and in came Sylvester carrying his harsh field. Daniel followed behind carrying a chair, which he set on the stage beside Ferdinand. Sylvester's sudden appearance was a surprise even to me, which of course meant a stir ran through the audience. Nobody had expected a standard tea party to be extended without warning by a visit from the Archduke. The attendees started to flounder, and I had to hold back the urge to yell that I was feeling the exact same way. Ferdinand glared at me and murmured I was not informed of this, to which I whispered back, he found us just a second ago. Meanwhile, I could see Florencia shrugging her shoulders a bit worried, but no doubt unsurprised to have found out, been found out. I mean, yeah, they, I figured he'd find out eventually. I, just were, I was thinking he would find out, like, at the beginning of the stupid thing. The noble women and daughters who had been quietly listening to the music before were now chattering about Sylvester's appearance, so I held up the voice amplifying magic tool to my mouth and started making excuses. Ah, Baron Vesta said that he would like to put his full weight behind the printing industry, and thus is taking it upon himself to show his gratitude to all of you who have donated to help our cause. To that end, he has taken time out of his busy schedule to rush over and assist our humble concert, I said, knowing that anyone would believe Sylvester's appearance had been planned from the start when I saw how confidently he was holding his harspiel. The song that Lord Ferdinand and Abbey Investor are going to play for you today is one that you are all very familiar with. I announced the song, namely the one that Sylvester had played during spring prayer and signaled Ferdinand with my eyes. He let out a small sigh and played a few test notes on his harp spiel once again. Perhaps due to it being a song that everyone here was familiar with, or perhaps due to Sylvester loudly declaring that everyone was to sing along with him, the performance had become the most exciting one, at all, one of all. It truly was a spectacular finale to the concert with everyone singing along and feeling like a part of something greater than themselves. 
When the song was over, the hall broke out into spontaneous round of applause. The attendees made their shining wands appear and raised them high into the air to show respect and praise while Ferdinand and Sylvester exited the room. Help me! I believe we can all agree that this day has been a spectacular concert. Now, might I suggest buying some of our products as a way of remembering this day? The profits made from them will also go toward the, our donations. For the sake of a good cause, for the sake of donating, please strongly consider purchasing them. Now that Ferdinand and Sylvester were gone, it was time for business. Attendants entered the room with cards and traveled from the most expensive seats to the least, selling illustrations and cookies. Of course, the cards also carry the leftover programs. Cookies were being sold at a price of one small silver for ten, but the illustrations were five large silvers each. The programs were still the more comfortable three large silvers each, so I had assumed the extra fancy illustrations would only be bought by the most affluent nobles like Elvira. In reality, however, everyone was clawing to buy a ton of them. Uh-oh. Seeing other people spend money must have been a surefire way to loosen one's purse strings. <laughs> As I saw more than a few ladies reach for, cookie, reach for cookies after much deep thought, and others glaring at their purses for a while before picking up an illustration and gazing at the art. Even those in the standing gallery looked eager to spend. Ferdinand's love song had been enough to make them pass out, and their hearts seemed to have no way of resisting Wilma's beautiful illustrations. The noble daughters who purchased them gazed at them longingly, while then rolled them up to keep them from creasing and hugged them to their chests. Apparently, the illustrations were a literal treasure to them. And so the illustrations have sold out. Thank you all very much for your patronage. Thank you ever so much for attending today. I shall report the total amount of money that we have gathered today and where it was spent later in the winter. Everyone, please watch your step and carefully exit the concert hall. I saw the noble women off as they stumbled out of the room, their legs wavering like they were in the middle of a dream. It was safe to say that Ferdinand's charity concert had been an overwhelming success. I let out a sigh of relief and saw Elvira joyously smiling over the full set of illustrations she had purchased. I shall hear your excuses. It was several days after the concert, and Ferdinand had summoned me to his lecture room just like in the old days. His light golden eyes were filled with wrath, and his voice was chilly to the point where I was sure it was freezing the air. The illustra three illustrations were laid out. Oh, he managed to get them. How did he get them? Were laid out before him. I had thought that I had managed to sell them without him finding out, but seeing him in possession of all these made me want to pass out where I stood. Sylvester showed these to me while guffawing about how he saw a knight with them. Given that the name of the author was so kindly written on the back, I discovered the culprit with little issue. No! I know it's a printing tradition and all, but I can't believe I included publishing information. What was I thinking? Ferdinand gave me a harsh scolding and made me swear that I'd never sell them again. No! You're gonna... People... Actually, that would probably make them even more valuable to people. The epilogue. Let's... The customers have all left. Mark said, you have a report to give to Master Benno, no? At that, Lutz headed to Benno's office in the back of the store. He needed to inform him how much they had made from the Harshfield concert. The money brought in from the concert totaled 12 large golds, 8 small golds, and 6 large silvers. The overall profit exceeded 10 large gold after subtracting various expenses. Lutz went through the totals that he and Rosemond had calculated, and Benno's eye twitched at the shockingly high numbers. Not even Lutz had expected her to earn so much. Rosemond had asked him to print more before the concert, but he had been so certain they had already had enough that he had deliberately slowed down production. I really didn't expect all this stuff to sell out. Sometimes it's good to be wrong, I guess. Sounds like we gotta plan a second concert, Benno said, wearing the confident grin of someone who is planning to make tons of money. There likely won't be a second one. The high priest found out about the illustrations being sold and got really mad at her, Ben Lutz explained. Benno's subsequent agonized groan made him hesitant to explain that Rose might had only been found out because she printed the name of her workshop on the back. I believe she was told to never sell merchandise like that ever again. Lady Rosemine begged him to reconsider, even offering him a portion of the profits, but he said he didn't need the money and firmly refused. Ferdinand already had a stable source of income as a priest in the temple. He was compensated each time he helped the Archduke or the Knights Order carry out their duties, and he was given money whenever he designed or sold a new magic tool. This was all in addition to the wealth he had inherited from his deceased father. To Ferdinand, a portion of the illustration's profits was nothing. He had absolutely no need whatsoever to suffer for loose change. No, we'll sure are something, are, sure are something, huh? You could show them over ten large golds of profit, and they'd still call it loose change. Benno said, clearly impressed, but Rosemond was also a noble, and she had cursed all of the rich people in the world after hearing Ferdinand declare that. Lutz wasn't sure how to respond. 
But in any case, with Master Bando, with this much money, we shouldn't have any problems in Haas, right? That's what Lady Mom Rosemine was most concerned about. Ingo and his wife, the owners of the carpentry workshop that Rosemine exclusively gave business to, were currently living in the monastery at Haas, working day in and day out to ensure it was ready for the orphans. Lutz's own father, Deed, would also be helping there soon, having been contacted by the Gilberta Company. Even with the craftsmen from Haas helping them, Rosemine, Benno, and Gustav didn't have enough people in their respective workshops. So they were in the process of gathering as many external carpenters and builders as they could. It's more than enough. With this money, we can get things ready a lot faster, Benno said with a firm nod. We just finished bringing daily necessities over to Haas, so the craftsmen can live there while they work. There's food, firewood, and the materials need to make paper. Won't be long before we can take some gray priests and shrine maidens there to make the place more livable. How are things on the temple's end? Lutz took out and looked over his diptych, into which he had written the words, Workers selected, training select, started, request, winter preparations, hide glue, and hair sticks. The temple has finished selecting the gray priests and shrine maidens to go to Haas and is currently training them as chefs and workshop workers. They want us to let them know once we settle on a date to take them. I also have a request from Lady Rosemine. She would like to use a portion of the donations gathered from the concert for winter preparations with the Gilberta Company helping to butcher meat and such like we did last year. Nobody lives near the monastery in Haas, so she is considering making hide glue there. Having been given a request from a noble, Bano nodded it with a grimace. Well, our high and mighty noble friend has given us a huge lot of money. Might as well help the temple out with their winter prep. But the winter preparations of the matter sorted, Lutz somewhat mo hurriedly moved on to the next topic. Furthermore, Lady Rosemina said she would like to order more hair sticks, and she has requested that we keep bringing Tuli to her chambers. Tuli has not been fully educated in no matters, but what do we? What do you think, Master Benno? It was Benno's job to decide whether they could keep sending Tuli to the Archduke's adopted daughter as a craftswoman of the Gilberta Company. Meeting a single time for a reunion was one thing, but regular business would require much better behavior. Benno frowned and didn't answer, so let's push it a little harder. Lady Rose might have said that she strongly, strongly suggests we continue sending Tuli there. Strongly? Is she saying that knowing that knowing a commoner can't refuse a noble? Benno asked with a grimace, but let's could sympathize or could empathize with how Rosemine felt, so she had his full support this time. I believe that Lady Rosemine doesn't want to miss any opportunity that she might have to see her. The only time she gets to see her right now is when she's receiving her hair sticks. And that only happens once a season at most. Hair stick orders made from her home in the castle or the noble's quarter don't count either as Tuli cannot go to those places for obvious reasons. Lady Rosemine is aware of all this. She knew that her request was only feasible when she was in her orphanage director's chambers. Plus, Tuli needs a place to practice her manners like how I do with the Rosemine workshop. She can't practice at home just like I can't. Mano fell into thought for a bit and looked up. All right, we can take her with us. She definitely does need a place to practice. Tell Tuli to consider this as an opportunity for her to improve her manners and that she shouldn't open her mouth outside of the hidden room. Two days later, Lutz, Benno, and Tuli went to the orphanage director's chambers. Lutz, Benno had given the standard noble greeting, Rosemite ordered the three to step into her hidden room alongside Gil and Daniel. Her aura drastically softened the moment they were inside and while she looked at Tuli with eyes full of nostalgia, she didn't call out her name. Tuli remained silent as well. The magic contract forbade them from addressing each other as family, and Benno hadn't told Tuli that she could speak yet. They can't address each other as family, but that doesn't mean they can't give each other a hug, right? Right? Or is that against the magic contract? As the two looked at each other, Benno gave Tuli the hard gaze of an instructor. Tuli, nobody's going to criticize you for loosening up a bit in this room, but you need to stay positive, stay polite. You've got to learn how to interact with nobles somewhere, so consider this a place where you can mess up a little without consequences. Tuli nodded, the serious expression on her face. She had learned a lot about manners and speech over the past season in her fervent attempt to become a craftswoman skilled enough to meet Rosemine. But she wasn't quite good enough to safely interact with most nobles. Not even Lutz was, which is why he couldn't go to the nobles' quarter. Rosemine, if you want to keep having Tuli deliver your hair stick orders, then help her learn while she's here. She's not presentable to the public at all yet. Rosemine's expression tightened. She gave a big nod and turned to face Tuli on the other side of the table from her. At that, Tuli nervously took out a bundle of cloth from a wooden box, opened it, then lined the hair sticks up on the table. Rosemine held up a hand to stop her. You mustn't rush, rush Tuli. Relax and take all the time you need. In fact, allow me to demonstrate how it should be done. Watch carefully, for I have been taught by experienced noble arch noble wives. Rosemont said, returning the hair sticks to their box before pulling it over to her. She then took a deep breath, and once again her entire aura seemed to change in an instant. 
She tucks the bo touched the box's lid with a warm, peaceful smile. Each movement she made was careful and precise, yet her pale fingers moved with incredible grace. She slowly opened the box, following a practice rhythm that drew everyone's attention, everyone's eyes and focus to her hands, then took out the contents of both hands and undid the cloth as smoothly as a stream of flowing of moving water. What in the heck? Never before had Lutz seen such elegant movements. All she was doing was opening a box and removing its contents. But she was doing it so gently that he hadn't even heard a noise when she set the lid down. The cloth had almost seemed to unfold on its own, and the hair sticks now resting on Rosemine's small white fingertips seemed all the more fancy just from being in contact with her. Lutz had just witnessed how much of an impact the way something was treated could have on how cla high class it seemed. And it was such a shock for him that he felt as though he had been over hit over the head. What do you think? Rosemine asked. Lutz had no doubt that she was on an entirely different level from him. They had started at the same point, to be sure, and Lutz had even been working hard to improve his manners. But he was still nowhere even close to her. It seemed impossible that she could have grown so much over a single season. I know! <laughs> Benno looked impressed, too. You sure do look like an arch noble when you do that. Gotta say, I'm amazed you've learned that much in such a short period of time. Even if you have good teachers, you don't get that skilled without a lot of hard work. I figure you two can already guess this on your own, but flexing your movement, fixing your movements up like that after you've grown up doing something else isn't easy. I was quite desperate to learn since the high priest had offered me the keys to the book room as a reward, Rosemine said with a laugh. Everyone laughed a little, but she had put a great deal of effort into her studies, and the results made that apparent. Practice makes perfect. Let's would need to train just as hard if he wanted to become a merchant capable of doing business with her. Tuli, try copying what Lady Rosemine just did, Benno instructed. Tuli started taking out the flowery hair sticks while doing her best to copy what Rosemine did. And while her movements were a bit stiff, they were still a great deal better than what she had done just moments prior. Having an example to try and replicate in her head made a huge difference. Good. Meanwhile, Lutz closed his eyes and tried remembering how Rosemine's fingers had moved. He replayed what he had seen again and again, trying to burn the image of her graceful white fingers into his brain. How much am I going to need to practice before I can move like that? He thought to himself. Before he knew it, Tuli had lined up all the colorful flowers on the table. Lady Rosemine, if you read, if you desire a ceremonial hair stick, then I would suggest one that uses larger and more extravagant flowers, Benno said, getting Tuli to repeat his words. What do you think of these? If we make them the divine colors of autumn, I believe it would suit the flowing night sky that is your hair quite well. Lutz had never had Benno as a long-term teacher, nor had he ever gotten to see Benno do business with customers in the nobles' quarter. For this reason, he was fully focused on watching Benno do business with Rosemine, his noble customer. Gail was doing the same. A valid perspective. I prefer flowers that are closer to the sides, but I certainly would like their petals to move like they did on the last hair stick. I'm glad to hear that you liked it. In that case, we shall make flowers of this size in the divine color of autumn. Through further conversation, they settled on the center of the flower being dark yellow and the petals being light yellow. But the way that they spoke to one another wasn't anything like when, Master when mine and Benno hadn't used to discuss things. This was a noble and a humble merchant talking, and they were both making faces that Lutz didn't recognize at all. It was only then that Lutz realized that Rose's mind had been, had been relaxed and casual even outside of the hidden room. He had been see sure that he would catch up to her one day, but now he knew that he was wrong. After just a single season, Rose's mind was wearing the face of the Archduke's adopted daughter. It wouldn't be easy to reach her level at all. And what about the other flowers, Lady Rosemine? What color would you like for these? Benno asked, referring to the smaller flowers on the hair stick. Rosemine tilted her head and placed a hand on her cheek, then looked at Tuli with a smile. Given that this is an autumn hair stick, I believe I would be cute for there to be fruit decorations alongside the flowers. Please design an ornament that is reminiscent of a beautiful har autumn forest. It seemed that this was something they had already discussed when they were sisters, as Tuli simply nodded in understanding and wrote down autumn fruits in her diptych. Her handwriting was still much too crude for anyone except her to be able to read, but given how she hadn't even known how to read last year, that was still impressive progress. Am I making progress too? Les asked himself. He thought he had been. Everybody said that he was, but a feeling of unease spread through his chest nonetheless. Not even vast stores of wealth can guarantee me the opportunity to learn how to behave like a noble. The experience that these young ones have gained today is priceless. I am sure this will help them enormously in their growth. Lady Rosemont, I offer you my thanks from the bottom of my heart, Benno said before kneeling despite the fact that they were in the hidden room. Seeing that, Lutz and Tully copied him and kneel kneeling in the same way. Rosemont had previously said that people didn't change that easily, and even Benno had asserted that she was still the same person on the inside, but even if that was true, 
Even if people stayed the same on the inside, Lutz could feel a larger gap than he had ever expected form between him and Rosemine. He had slacked in his training, assuming that she wouldn't change that much, but during that time, she had steadily gotten even further out of his reach. Lutz could feel the cold sweat running down his back. The amount I've been working isn't going to cut it anymore. I've got to push myself even harder. Being my little sister's knight. Mother had said that she had important news and gathered Eckhart and I at the dinner table to discuss it over tea. The news was important enough to warrant using sound blocking magic tools and when she told us what it was, I couldn't believe my ears. You truly intend to take in a girl rights in the temple? I exclaimed, reflexively standing up from my chair, but Mother simply motioned for me to sit back down without criticizing me for my rude outburst. Once I was seated again, she nodded with a serious expression. Yes, Cornelius. Okay, this is Cornelius' little side story. She will be baptized as the daughter of Karstad and I. Then she will be adopted by Ob Arenfest. Ob Arenfest is adopting a girl right from the temple? It wasn't easy for me to believe that a girl, due to, being, due to be adopted by the Archduke, would have been raised in the temple, nor was it easy for me to accept that she would soon become my little sister. Everything was happening too suddenly. I looked over at Eckhart in confusion, hoping that he would share my reluctance and expressed his own disapproval, but it appeared that he had already accepted her. His blue eyes crinkled in a smile as he started telling me about our future little sister. Rosemine had much to do with Lady Veronica's fall from grace. She is his father's daughter when he placed, whom he placed in the temple under Lord Ferdinand's protection. She has dark blue hair that looks to be blessed by the God of Darkness, complimenting her golden eyes that look to be blessed by the Goddess of Light. The Archduke decided to adopt her upon hearing about her enormous quantity of mana. What are you talking about, Eckert? Father never had a dot I began, but Mother caught me off. She is Rosemary's daughter. Rosemary? As in, Father's third wife? I couldn't believe it. The air had turned to poison whenever Father's second and third wife met. And they were bitterly engaged in a verbal sparring contest that always hurt to listen to. Their families were involved in the feud as well, and Mother always struggled to act as an arbitrator between them. Yet does Father intend to bring discord into our family again? We shall claim that she is my daughter instead to avoid that. Hold on a second. You remember how awful things were before Rosemary climbed the towering stairway, right? Things are finally peaceful, and now you want to bring Rosemary's daughter into the main state? As your own daughter, no less. This is like a nightmare. Father's second and third wives living in buildings that were separate from the main estate, so I rarely ever saw them. That was the only reason I had managed to endure their feud. But if this new girl was going to be trusted as mother's daughter, or treated as mother's daughter, then she would be living in the main building prior to moving to the castle. You don't need to worry about that, worry that much, Cornelius, Eckert said. And why is that, Eckert? You and father might be okay with this since you're adults and have rooms elsewhere. But I'm going to be stuck living here with her. As guards of the Archducal family, Lamprit and father had rooms in the night storms while Eckert just fl had flown the nest and now owned his own home. I, on the other hand, had nowhere to run. I glared at Eckert and he glared right back. You're not appreciating the significance of her having been trained under Lord Ferdinand himself, Eckert said. He would never send her here if she wasn't already a model arch noble daughter. Lamprit and I saw her perform the healing ritual during the last trauma extermination mission and it was quite an impressive sight. Well, I think you view Lord Ferdinand too highly, brother. Ooh, they better not hear you say that. I knew that I would have been scolded for saying that out loud, yes. So I kept my complaints to myself. Eckert thought the world of Ferdinand, and I had been told many times over how many times over how fine of a man he was. But due in part to my age, I had never met Ferdinand myself, as this so this boundless praise didn't really mean much to me. Besides, if he was really so amazing, then he should have just gotten rid of Veronica before she forced him into the temple. That was probably easier said than done, dude. You don't even know the circumstances beside behind why he left and what she had done to him. I don't really know the circumstances either, but still. I must say, dear Eckert, your confidence in this matter brings much peace to my heart. Oh, and by the way, Cornelius, you will serve as Rosamond's guard. Mother, please don't decide such things on your own. I don't want to be a retainer to anyone in the Archducal family. You should know that. Father served an ob who had essentially been a puppet of his mother. Eckert's life was being swung all over the place by his lord's ups and downs, and Lampert spent every day suffering under his selfish master. I didn't want to endure a fate like that, and I had said this to Mother over and over again. Why would she tell me to guard an adopted member of the Archduke family who I hadn't even met yet for? Neither of us have any choice in the matter. There are very few knights who would be willing to guard Rosemine. Nobody knew what kind of girl Rosemine was yet, or how Veronica's fall would impact Florencia and the Lies Gang family. For that reason, they apparently needed a knight who was of a high enough status to serve the Archduke, but who also wasn't too involved in either faction. There was also the fact that since Rosemine was said to be become the High Bishop, the knight would need to be someone who was willing to enter the temple. 
Once all those criteria were all taken into account, there really weren't many options. Yeah. No way are there any female knights who would be willing to go to the temple. Of course, there is also the fact that I would at least, like at least one member of our family to stay with her while she is in the castle. You may leave her side when she becomes old enough to select her own retainers, but I will ask you to guard her for two or three years. Veronica's fall had sent tremors throughout the entire nobles' quarter. It was obvious that we'd want as much information as we could get on matters surrounding the Archducal family, and if she would be joining their home as mother's daughter, then we would want someone trusted nearby so that we could stay informed of her situation in the castle. And then there was the fact that I was the only one in the family who didn't yet have a master. As a proper arch noble, it wasn't my place to refuse. I gave a silent nod, keeping my dissatisfaction in my chest as I was unable to complain any further. <coughs> it was with that dissatisfaction still stirring inside of me that I met my new little sister Rosamine for the first time. Eckert had been right when he said that she had been raised well. Despite being brought up in the temple, in fact, she seemed about as well behaved as I would have expected for the daughter of Rosemary, a med noble. Despite not having been baptized yet, she had for some reason been given a ring that could expel mana and she was able to give a proper noble greeting. Avar, regarding Rosemine's future education. Once they had finished exchanging greetings, Ferdinand got straight to the point. Rosemine was a topic of conversation, but she couldn't make any contributions herself as she was just a kid. She shrunk into her chair, stuck with nowhere else to go, and I could see her hands trembling a little in her lap. My sympathies. A girl raised in the temple had been brought to an archnoble estate out of nowhere to be adopted by the archduke. Anyone would be nervous. The stiff smile she was forcing under her young face no doubt belied the in immense pressure she was feeling when they the surface. But the adults were so absorbed in their conversation that they paid no mind to her as how anxious she was bound to be in a strange new place. Might as well help her out a bit, I thought before calling out to her. Rosemine, sounds like you're going to have a lot of work dropped on you after this. Think you'll be able to handle it? I shall do my best to become a little sister you can be proud of, Cornelius. I have already made a promise to Lord Ferdinand and Lord Sylvester, so failure is not an option for me, she responded. While her voice fit it clear that Rosemary was still quite young, there, were a fear, there was a fierce resolve in her golden eyes unlike anything I ever would have expected from a little girl. I had no idea what promise she had made to Ferdinand and the Archduke, but I could tell that it was something significant, something that she had to follow through on, something that demanded she chant charge forward without ever looking back. Her golden eyes looked like those of a knight who had sworn to protect their liege, which made me like her at least a tiny bit more. I like seeing eyes like that. Uh... No, I don't think you have much to worry about. I know I'll be proud of you, have you as my little sister. Rosemine's eyes widened, then a happy smile spread across her face. I thank you ever so much, Cornelius. She looked a lot cuter when she was happy than, when, than she did when nervous. I let out a sigh of relief upon seeing her relax, at which point I felt someone's gaze on me. I turned and made eye contact with the grinning Ferdinand. It's good to see you two get along, getting along, he said, no doubt having planned for this to happen. His smug look kind of annoyed me, but like a proper noble, I just smiled and played, paid it no mind. Rosemine's arch-noble arch education started the next morning. Her, arch, her schedule was packed with studying for the entire day, and while it might have been necessary, it was a brutal amount for a young girl like her. I would have just thrown up my hands and given up in her situation, but Rosemine didn't say a word of complaint, instead tearing through her assignments one by one. Her talent both for learning and for playing the harsh field was shocking, and the tutors who told Mother about her results absolutely lathered her with praise. Rosemine herself complained that she was having a hard time remembering the names of nobles, but she was learning them so quickly that it hardly seemed like she was struggling at all. I could tell that she was really smart. Vernon had been most worried about her language and how she carried herself, but with Mother training her, she was acting more like an arch noble each day. Even when we were eating meals, I could see her focusing on her hands as she attempted to master proper eating etiquette. Mother, is Rosemine still studying? I asked, picking up the cup of tea that my attendant had brewed for me when Mother invited me to the table. I had just gotten home from my apprentice night training, but Rosemine was still in her room. Mother nodded. She is indeed. I believe that Rosemine is putting her all into her studying so that she may acquire the case of the book room. It is very easy to see how dedicated she is. Every day she shows clear signs of improvement and her talents make it more than clear that why she caught Lord Ferdinand's attention. You will need to work extra hard to stay ahead of her, Cornelius, otherwise you will be very embarrassed when you return to the Royal Academy with her. Mother said with a pleased smile as she sipped her tea. Ferdinand was visiting every other day or so to check up on Rosamond, which did wonders for Mother's mood, and led to Father coming home more irregularly. Mother and Father generally treated each other coldly because of the drama between wives, but now they were talking normally. Everything they spoke about was in relation to... Rosemine's baptism or her education, but still, it was a relief just to see them not in each other's throats. 
There was also the fact that once Lampert had become Wilfred's retainer, Mother had no one at home to speak to except me. And now she was talking to Roseminer about beauty and fashion trends. As expected, she was finding it a lot more entertaining talking to another girl, and I often found them both regularly dis eagerly discussing Ferdinand. I had been worried about another girl joining the family, since I had only had or had brothers, and father's second and third wives had been nothing but trouble for me. But I couldn't deny that her presence here was having a real positive impact. So Cornelius, what do you think of these sweets? Rosemine's personal chef knows many unusual recipes, and she had just started trading recipes with her own head chef. The strange-looking sweets were apparently known as cookies. I was a bit hungry after training, so out of curiosity, I bit into one. It was crunchy and had a comfortable amount of sweetness, which made it very easy to eat. So easy, in fact, that I found myself eating more and more while I was listening to Mother talk. I'm currently prioritizing sweet recipes that I can serve at tea parties, but at some point I would like to exchange for main courses as well. I've always been a fan of tasty sweets and delicious food. Honestly, it feels pretty good to have a little sister who's so talented. I didn't really have the highest opinion of the temple-bred nobles who had returned to society en masse after the Sovereignty's Purge, but maybe Rosemary was un entirely unlike them given that she had put under been put under Ferdinand's custody. The way she spoke about the temple was also a lot different from how the others had. Apparently it was a really formal place with a lot of restrictions. I ate breakfast at second bell, then went over my schedule for the day with my attendance when I was done. After that, I practiced Harshfield until third bell, at which point I headed to the high priest chambers to help Ferdinand with his work. Math is my specialty. Oh yeah, your math teacher did have a lot of praise for your ability. Lunch was at fourth bell, after which I would memorize religious verses for rituals, visit the orphanage as the orphanage director, or summon merchants to my chambers. After that, I would go to the temple's book room, assuming I had any time to spare. As far as I could tell from what Rosemine had said, she couldn't leave the temple freely to say visit a friend's house with her parents, and she was too weak to run around outside. A girl this young having nothing to do in her free time but read quietly in a book room? Sheesh, now that's torture. As someone who liked gathering in the noble's forest and the exercise I got from my apprentice night's training, I couldn't help but want to show her more of the outside world. Rosemine, is there anything you want to do? Once you've finished all the stuff you need to do before your baptism, I'll take you anywhere you want to go, I said, and Rosemine beamed a smile. Really? I want to go to the book room and read some books then. No, no, not the book room. Anywhere else, I said, hurriedly turning her down. She immediately gave me a troubled frown, let her eyes wander around the room for a moment, and then looked at me tearfully. I'm sorry, Cornelius, but that's all I can think of. Of course, the only real respite they ever gave her was the book room, so of course she doesn't know where else she would go. That's no good at all. I can't leave her with Fur Dad if he's never going to take her outside the temple for anything but work. I've got to help her myself. Obviously, he doesn't know the truth, but whatever. Give up. Some plans are doomed to fail. Ferdinand shot me down the second I suggested taking Rosemine outside to play. And perhaps due to her weakness, he even went as far as to tell me not to take her outside unless I could cast healing magic and mix healing potions for her. I understand, but she has finished all the work that she had to do before her baptism. I think she needs some time to rest and enjoy herself. She needs to see the world outside of the temple. A place where Rosemine can enjoy herself without putting her at risk. Hmm? Your only option would be your estate's book room then. You still need to keep a clo you will still need to keep a close eye on her, but this will be a perfect opportunity for you to get used to serving as her knight. I wasn't sure what he expected me to do if she was just going to be reading books, but Ferdinand claimed it would be good training. He started teaching me to keep an eye on her walking pace on the way to the library, as well as how long the books I gave her should be, and how I should co could confiscate them from her. I know she's weak and all, but do we really need to be this cur cautious when she's just reading books inside? If all else fails and the situation gets out of hand, summon me with an ordinance. The next day, I guided Rosemine to our estate's book room, even though I was still confused by how neurotic Ferdinand's instructions had seemed. If you ask me, there was nothing fun in that stuffy book room packed with nothing but hard books and boring documents. Well, he obviously doesn't know that she's obsessed with books. I would have much rather been taking Rosemine outside, but making her happy was the most important thing here. When I told Rosemine that Ferdinand had permitted her to visit our book room as a reward for finishing her work, she looked at me with the happiest smile I had ever seen in my life. I can't believe this estate has a book room. From the very bottom of my heart, I am glad to have joined your family. I am glad to have finished my work so quickly. Praise be to the God, she declared, suddenly assuming the praying pose. She really was raised to the temple, I thought to myself in amusement before holding out a hand. I couldn't properly escort her due to he me being so much taller than her, but we could at least hold hands while slowly walking together. You sure like to exaggerate, huh? There's a lot out there that's more fun than a book room. There's nothing I will ever find more fun than books, Cornelius. 
Rosamond's golden eyes were twinkling with pure joy, and as she spoke, she sped up to walk faster than normal. She must have really been eager to visit the book room. You like books that much, Rosamond? Yes, I love them. What kind of books are in this book room? They must be different from the ones in the temple. I positively can't wait, Rosamond said, looking more energetic than usual. Then, when we got to the book room, she suddenly passed out right in front of me. He warned you. She had been smiling and talking like normal, but out of nowhere her knees collapsed and she fell onto the ground where she stopped moving entirely. But what? What? My hand was still grasping hers and as pathetic as it was, all I could do was panic. I was struck, stuck there floundering for a moment until I remembered that Ferdinand had given me permission to summon him. I hurriedly took out my staff and sent out an ordinance to him, believing that he was in the temple. Lord Ferdinand rose my lost consciousness and collapsed out of nowhere. Unsurprising, it is possible that she hit her head, so take care not to abruptly move her. Ferdinand flew over on his high beast right after sending his response. He checked Rose's mind, told an attendant to carry her off to bed, then sat and looked down at me. I repeatedly warned you to be very careful, as Rose's mind is weak and sickly, but I imagine you did not take me seriously. You thought I was being neurotic and overprotective. He did. So you did not stop her when she sped up in excitement on the way to the bookroom, did you? You're exactly right, I said sadly. I didn't have any room to protest whatsoever. Never in my wildest dreams had I thought she would pass out just from walking down the hall. This is how poorly she fares outside. inside. Going outside is indeed out of the question. Do you understand that now? Absolutely. I now also understand why I must become Rosemind's knight. There needed to be someone there to teach her retainers that Ferdinand's warnings were true and beyond necessary. Otherwise, if she were to collapse in the castle, her attendants would be punished for failing to keep her healthy, while her knights would be punished for failing to keep her safe. Your understanding in the matter is appreciated, Ferdinand said, slightly raising an eyebrow as he continued to look down at me. Daniel has served her for half a year in the temple, but he is a lay noble. He does not have the status to advise her retainers. You will be playing an essential role here as both her family and an archduke. Or an arch noble. When it comes to protecting Rosemine, what you must be wary of about all else are her reckless family members. Sylvester, who is always bearing a hand and doing things his own way. Wilfred, who is well known for being a self-centered hooligan. And finally, your own grandfather, who seems to be putting his all into his granddaughter's baptism ceremony. Wait, who's... Who's the grandfather? Because Carstead would be her father. Who's... Have we met his grandfather yet? Or her, her grandfather yet? I don't think so. You will need to pay them all great heed. If you carelessly take your eyes off Rosebine, she will no doubt die in the most ridiculous of ways while you are not looking. I instinctively knew that he wasn't just making an empty threat. He was stating a simple, immovable fact. My duty was to keep Rosemine alive until she chose her retainers, at which point I could retire as her knight. Lord Ferdinand, would it be possible to make Lord Wilford and my grandfather understand how weak Rose's mind is before she acquires her retainers, so that no disaster strikes in the castle? If possible, I would like this to be done under your observation. She was so weak that it would be impossible to protect her if others didn't understand the extent of her weakness. For this reason, it was important for them to learn before she moved to the castle. Mm. I see whether I can think of an effective plan, Ferdinand replied, tapping a finger against his temple. Again... <laughs> 20 pages. No, actually less than that because there's still the afterword. One stressed out chef. Hugo, a car from the other offmer company with the desserts for tomorrow was here. I don't know why, but Lace is with them. I reflexively clicked my tongue. Tomorrow was the day that the Archduke's party would be arriving at the Italian restaurant. As it turned out, the apprentice blue shrine maiden whom I had been training under had been an arch noble girl all along. Her devoted efforts, to, efforts in the workshop and the orphanage had been praised widely enough for her to be recognized and adopted by the Archduke which also involved her name being chose from, changed from mine to Rosemine. For some reason, I didn't know much about noble affairs, so that wasn't a big deal to me. And as a commoner chef, it wasn't much of a difference between serving a lay noble or an arch noble, or whatever. To be honest, I knew that being the archduke's adopted daughter was a big deal, but it was so far beyond my realm of understanding that it didn't really click. Looking back, I was blown away by how crazy of a place I had been training in. So yeah, I was pretty involved when it came to the whole noble business. But the Archduke getting interested in the eatery that his adopted daughter had been funding and wanting to go was another matter entirely. That involved me directly. I would have to serve food to the Archduke. Oh dear. In our normal circumstances, it would be unthinkable for the Archduke to travel to the lower city just to visit an eatery, even if it had been funded by his daughter. That was why Benno from the Gilberta Company and his new funding partner from the Offmer Company were doing everything they could to ensure that there was no mishaps whatsoever. They would be selecting the highest quality meat and vegetables, carrying them in, double-checking things with the waiters, and keeping in regular contact with the temple. We were better at making Lady Rosemond's food since she had been available to give us indirect instructions, but 
Frustratingly enough, Lace was better when it came to baking sweets. That was why the Guildmaster's granddaughter, Frida, had decided to put in her in charge of making the desserts tomorrow, namely the pound cake, sponge cake, and milk crepes. We were still responsible for any final touch-ups, but that didn't change the fact that she was stealing our work, which really didn't feel great. I wanted to bake some desserts of my own to upstage her, but I was too busy baking the consomme. Six bell rang just a second ago. What's Lace doing here when we're so busy, I fumed. It wasn't that I was annoyed to see Lace. I'd just been planning to clean up a little before she arrived. Honestly. Honest, but unfortunately it seemed that she had heard me loud and clear. She barged into the kitchen carrying a big plate with top of the dome-shaped metal cover and glared at me. I came to deliver some desserts and taste test your stuff. What else? Are you making something you don't want me seeing? Don't tell me you messed up on the consomme of all things, she said with a snort. Like heck we did. We're freaking busy making dinner. What are you doing here? I had been at the Guildmaster's place learning noble recipes, part of Lady... Until just recently, so I knew where Lace was going to be at her, bus at her busiest. That is, right now. It didn't make any sense for her to come here, and anybody else could have brought the desserts. I finished dinner prep a long time ago and decided to leave the, test the rest to my assistants, Lace said dismissively, before putting her plate down and extending a hand toward me. So, Hugo, did you manage to make some consomme that won't embarrass you and everyone else? Consomme was an essential part of Lady Rosemine's menu, but it was by far the most exhausting and time-consuming of all the recipes. To make matters worse, it was a dish that was most unlike anything that was usually ate, so failing here would cause everything else to fail, too. That was why I had spent my afternoon focusing on the consomme, refusing to leave the pot for even a moment, and instead just shouting my instructions to Todd and my assistants. Consomme was the result of very, very carefully cooking the top-class ingredients that the Offmer Company had provided, and the aroma wafting through the kitchen alone was enough to make it clear how well made it was. And it's even better knowing that Lace still can't make double consomme. I returned Lace's smug look and poured some still spe steaming consomme into a small taste testing bowl, similar to the ones we had used back in Lady Rosemine's kitchen. Have a taste and see for yourself. Lace took the bowl of consomme and swished it around a bit, looking for any cloudiness among the pure liquid. She then gave it a sniff before slowly easing the bowl's contents into her mouth. God, my stomach's killing me! Not only was Lace both Todd and my teacher in regards to noble food, she was my ultimate rival when it came to seeing who could make Lady Rosemine's recipes better. I was confident in this dish, but it was still nerve-wracking having to wait for her judgment. I knew that I'd be die inside if she scrunched up her face while tasting it, but all I could do was wait nervously. Lace frowned, unamused. Looks like I really don't need to butt in, she said, thrusting the bowl back at me before shouting to the people outside the kitchen. Come on, bring it all in. Heck yeah, I won. Basking in a sense of victory, I set the carried in desserts into the winter prep room of the kitchen where it was coldest and moved the pot of consomme to the storage room. At times like this, I wished I had the big ice room that we had at the temple on hand, but as it ran on mana, something that only nobles had, neither the Guildmaster's place nor the Italian restaurant had one. It was a real shame since it was beyond convenient. Todd and I thoroughly checked that everything was ready for tomorrow, then I finished cleaning up and locked the, locked the doors to go home. Ended up leaving kind of late, I thought to myself as I power walked through the fancy northern part of the city. The Italian restaurant was located in a nice spot in town, just northeast of the city center, so heading straight down would take me to the main street, connecting the east and west gates. I glanced at the bustling east gate as the sky darkened and then entered a narrow side alley, turning away the women looking for customers. Oh, God. When I reached the well closest to my place, I stopped for a moment and looked up, hoping to see my very recent... Girlfriend, Kirk. Oh, he's got a girlfriend! Luckily, there was a shadow in the window to her room. Welcome home, Hugo, she called down. Tomorrow's the big day, isn't it? Good luck. Yep, it's going to be great, I called back. I knew that everyone would be able to hear me since it was no summer and their windows were open, but I didn't care. I had taken training under an apprentice blue shrine maiden, and being selected as the head shelf of the Gilberta Company's high-class eatery for fate to finally bless me with a girl. Listen up, everyone. Hear how happy I am. At next year's summer festival, I'm going to be the star of the show. After years of throwing towels during the summer, the Star Festival, it was finally my time to be the star. I had made it in time for this year's festival, but next year would be my night year. I was going to dodge towels from lonely, jealous bo bo losers and run home with my new wife. To that end, I needed to make sure that tomorrow's lunch succeeded no matter what, both for my future as a chef and for my marriage. I'm going to- Oh, he found somebody! Here you go, is awesome! I'm so happy for him. So, the day of my most important challenge finally came. I desperately cooked with Todd and my assistants, feeling such a tight knot in my stomach that I was close to throwing up. The whole time, Todd and I kept reminding ourselves that we were fine. Lady Rosemine herself had assured us that we were good enough. Everything would be okay. The Archduke and all of the nobles said that they had never tasted anything like this cooking before, and each person was beyond satisfied, Mark said. 
as he pushed a cart back into the kitchen, having finished serving dessert. Only once hearing that the customers were satisfied that I had succeeded did the tension drain from my body and a smile spread across Mark's face as he saw Todd and me fall to our knees on the spot. Excellent work, everyone, he continued. I know that you all wish to eat, rest, but remember that this is now time for the waiters and attendants to eat. Give it one last push. As Mark's instructions, we prepared meals for everyone else. The attendants from the temple and the musicians ate in the side room while waiters searched for places to sit at empty tables around the kitchen or by the doors in some halls. Todd and I hadn't been raised to be as proper as the attendants or employees of major stores, so we were fine eating while standing. The food tasted so good that it almost moved me to tears, maybe due to the immense relief of having succeeded. But the story didn't end there. For some reason, the nobles then flew out of the restaurant and strange flying animals bring Benno, Mark, and the guildmaster along with them. We saw them off in a daze, but the passerby on the street were throwing a huge panicked fuss. Screams and yells could be heard coming from outside, and then we had people rushing to the eatery to ask what was going on. With all those in charge having been taken away, the only two who could deal with the crowd were Frida and Fran, the latter being one of Rosemont, Lady Rosemont's attendants. They politely apologized and explained that nobles did as nobles would, offering to pass on complaints if anybody had any. But few seemed interested in complaining directly to nobles, and so the crowd naturally dispersed. Once everything calmed down and we had finished cleaning up the kitchen, the nobles came back. Mark slid away from the group, entering the dining room hall, and summoned Todd and I. Yeah. Hugo Todd, I have important news. Due to very profound circumstances involving the Archduke... I don't know where she is! The opening of the Italian restaurant will be delayed by a month or possibly two. You will, of course, still be paid during this time, but we would ask you to continue working for that pay. Is that acceptable? I didn't mind as long as we weren't getting fired out of nowhere. Doing work for pay was just the way of the world. Todd and I nodded together, and Mark gave a smile. Thank you very much. I appreciate your understanding in this matter. Now, would you rather work in the Noble's Quarter or the Temple for the next month? What? The plan today was to sell Lady Rosemine's recipes to those important visitors who came to eat today. But Lady Rosemine's recipes are a bit unusual, are they not? There needs to be someone who could teach the others directly, and to that end, we would like you two to teach their chefs. Lady Rosemine's recipes certain, certainly weren't str were strange. A lot of prep work went into maximizing the flavor, and some of the poking methods were hard to believe at first. Someone looking at them on paper would almost certainly expect the food to taste bad. From my experience, I had found that the more experience a person had, the harder it would be for them to believe and understand the recipes. Ella was younger than me, and she had gotten used to them pretty quickly, while Todd still ended up getting confused while we were cooking. In fact, there weren't even any guarantee that noble chefs could take us seriously, even when we were teaching them directly. I've got to go to the temple, Todd said, the blood draining from his face as he clutched my arm. Please, Hugo, I'll die before I go to the noble's quarter. He was useless whenever he got too nervous, and he feared nobles so much that he even tried his best to avoid Lady Rosemine whenever he was in the temple. That said, he was at least familiar with the temple, and it would no doubt be better to have him go there than brave the noble's quarter. Yeah, I don't think you'd survive there either. You could take the temple. Thanks, Hugo. I owe you one. Not that I'm going to have a good time in the noble's quarter either. Pretty sure I'm going to be throwing up every day from the stress. I see. It's settled then. Please come with me to the dining hall. Mark brought Todd and me to the dining hall, where we were introduced to today's chefs by Lady Rosemont. After fussy negotiations that seemed to be centered around money, we were, rested, we were rented to the nobles as teachers for one month. On my way home, I saw Kirk among the women preparing dinner by the well. I said hello, grinning at the thought that by this time next year, we'd be married and she'd be making that food for me. It kind of felt like we were already newlyweds. Did you even discuss this with her? Hi, Hugo. How'd it go? Did everything turn out okay? Yeah. In fact, it went so well that I'm going to be going to the Nobles Quarter for a whole month. I'll be teaching noble chefs how to cook those new recipes. Really? Wow. Teaching in the Nobles Quarter? That's amazing, Kirk said. Her eyes exclaimed her eyes glittering. I held my head up with pride only for my mom to emerge from the crowd of women and scold me for not telling her first. Sorry, Mom. Kirk's a lot more important to me right now. Kirk saw me off on the day I was leaving for the Nobles Quarter. Good luck. It'll be lonely, but I'll be here waiting for you, she said. Once I had said my goodbyes, I headed to the central plaza where I met with Todd, and together we went to the temple. When second bell rang, we identified ourselves to the great priest standing guard, who took us not to the familiar orphanage director's chambers, but to the high bishop's chambers, deep, deep within the temple. Good morning, Lady Rosemine. Good morning, Hugo. Good morning, Todd. I imagine it will be a great struggle to work in the kitchen of a noble who isn't me, but I trust you will be both do well, Lady Rosemine said in the expensive-looking clothes of a proper noble girl. Zom, Todd is here. At that, a great priest apparently called Zom began lighting up large golds and silvers on the table. That was my first time seeing a large gold. Whoa, and there are so many. This seems to be the correct amount. Zom, please guide Todd to Ferdinand's kitchen. Fran, please gather the money and contact Ferdinand. 
As he wished, Sam took away the uneasy looking Todd while Fran put the money into a bag and exited the room. In their place came Nicola, who had sometimes helped out in the kitchen, and Ella, who had become Lady Rosemont's personal chef. Lady Rosemont, I have brought Ella. Thank you, Nicola. I never. I now ask that you take Hugo and Ella to the carriage for attendance. As you wish, Ella, Hugo, please follow me. We followed Nicola to the temple's gate, where we found unbelievably beautiful carriages for noble use. Lady Rosemont will be living in the castle from today onward, so carriages have been sent for her as well. Please wait here until Lady Rosemont and the High Priest are ready, Nicola said. Commerce couldn't enter the noble quarter without noble approval. Thanks, Nicola, Ella replied. I know it will be hard without me for a bit, but I'm sure you'll be fine. I will be, now that a lot of great priests and shrine maidens are learning. I can't wait for you to learn a lot of new recipes and come back to teach me more, Nicola said before turning on her heel and heading off. Ella waved Nicola goodbye as she left. I could guess that a lot had happened with Ella over the winter while Todd and I were gone, so she looked a lot more mature than she used to be. Wait, did you come of age? It was only once we had stepped into the carriage and were out of sight that I could finally relax, at which point I noticed something that I hadn't been before. Of course Ella looked more mature. She had her hair tied up. Uh-huh, back in spring. Though I missed the coming of age ceremony since I was in the nobles' quarter. That's a shame. Hmm? I don't really think so. Lady Rosemont gave me new recipes to celebrate and a small meat grinder to use in the kitchen since we girls lack arm strength. <laughs> meat grinders were machines that minced meat. The ones in the city were pretty large and owned by butchers who used them to crush a lot of meat for turning into sausage and those definitely weren't small enough for an individual to own. I never thought there existed small meat grinders. It sounds like it would make it a lot easier to make ground beef. No fair. She said she'd ask a smith she'd know to make other cooking tools for me too. Us women have it rough in the nobles' quarters, so if she wants it to be as easy as possible for me to cook. It sounded like Lady Rosemont had really taken a shine to Ella. She had never given me any tools to make cooking easier. Again, no fair. Hey, Ella, that reminds me. Where in the nobles' quarter are we going? Huh? Where else but the Archduke's castle? Kind of slow on the uptake there, Hugo. The castle? I mean, I'd heard that we were going to the nobles' quarter, but nothing else. I had assumed that Lady Rosemary would be going to the castle while I would be sent to the knight commander's home, but according to Ella, she and I were both going to the castle's kitchen. Ella was a woman who had just come of age, and people would no doubt be judging her by her looks more than her talents. That was why she would be teaming up with me until she was a regular member of the castle's kitchen. On top of that, the knight commander would be sending his estate's head chef to the castle to learn recipes. Ella knew that chef and had taught him some recipes before. He apparently still looked down on her, but he was sucking it up because he wanted to know Lady Rosemont's met recipes that badly. I thought I was going to be thrown into a kitchen even bigger than the one in, Lady, in Lord Carstairs' estate all alone, so I'm glad you're here with me, the Hugo. It feels like such a long time ago that they were first going to the temple's kitchen together. That time, it was Benno taking us to the temple. Well, now it's Lady Rosemont taking us to the Archduke's castle. It's only for a bit, but we're court chefs now, huh? Just the thought is making my stomach hurt. The very idea of a commoner chef suddenly shooting up to be a court chef of the Archduke was staggering, especially after hearing Ella talk about how prideful and arrogant noble chefs were. Hugo, you're actually more of a scaredy, a scaredy shoe mill than Todd, aren't you? It's not every day you get a whole new workplace like this. Let's do our best to sniff out new recipes. It's good to have go a goal to work toward. Alright, you know, you're right. I'm even going to go and talk to Kirk's dad when I get back from the noble's corner. What? Kirk? Hugo, did you get a girlfriend? Ella asked her mouth agape. It was written all over her face that she couldn't believe it. Believe it or not, I don't care. Facts are facts. Yep, not too long ago. Working for a noble in the temple got my name out there. And before I knew it, we were dating. I can't imagine it'd be too hard for you to get a boyfriend, and I very much recommend it. It's a lot easier to work hard when you've got a special someone to impress. Wow, very cool. I'll definitely keep that in mind, Ella replied, clearly not interested at all. She was so obsessed with cooking that despite coming of age, she still seemed to be a little kid who had no interest in romance. We're not working here forever, but you can't get much more prestigious than a court chef. You know Kirk's dad will let me marry her on that alone? Or you think Kirk's dad will let me marry her on that alone? Assuming she doesn't break up with you while you're away at the castle. Oh, don't say that. I've been stuck throwing towels at the Star Festival over the last couple years, but next year will be different. I'll do it. Once I get back from training in the castle, I'll go straight to Kirk's dad and ask her for his permission. Woo-woo! You go, you go! Oh, boy. Okay, that's it, everybody. Part 9 is done and we're going to be getting into volume nine next time i'll see y'all next time